Hello there, it's me, Madame Macabre, aka Katie O'Laughlin. I hope you're in the mood for some ghost stories, because we're about to delve into my very own book of terrifying tales. Don't open the door, scary stories and American folk tales. Today, we'll be diving in to section one, common fears. This section is full of stories about scary scenarios that many people are afraid of. Is your fear in here too? The Watcher in the Woods Todd was very excited to start his new part-time job. He had been hired to help out at the bookshop on the edge of town. Not only did this make Todd feel very grown up and proud, but he was also looking forward to having more spending money than any allowance he'd ever had before. Everything was shaping up to be perfect. Well, that is, except for getting there. The hours clashed with his parents' work, so they couldn't drive him, and his bicycle had recently broken. This meant he had no choice but to walk there. Fortunately, the walk wasn't bad. He could be there in 20 minutes if he moved quickly. Or he could even cut the time in half to 10 minutes if he took the shortcut through the woods. Why wouldn't you take the shortcut? You might be wondering to yourself. Well, word around town was there was a frightening entity that lurked in those woods. Local kids had taken to calling it the Watcher in the Woods. They said that if you were to go through the forest alone, the Watcher would appear and begin following you. He'd start out slow, but then pick up his pace until he was frighteningly fast. If he got a hold of you, rumor was that you'd never be seen again. If you wanted to pass through the woods safely, it was said that you'd need to move quickly. As fast as you may have thought you were, odds were that the Watcher was faster. Your only hope was to make it past the tree line of the forest. The Watcher in the woods couldn't venture there. Once you made it out, you'd be safe. Or at least... That's what they said anyways. Todd thought himself far too old to still believe in silly, childish tales, but he couldn't deny that the thought of this strange figure spooked him a bit. He'd never admit it to his friends, but the thought of the Watcher lingered on his mind so greatly that for the first week of work he chose to walk the long way so he would not have to enter the forest. Despite this route being a little annoying, taking twice as long to get to work, this worked out just fine. That is, until one day, Todd found himself running late. He was still rather new at the job and knew that showing up late wouldn't look good while he was trying to make a good impression. While walking to work, Todd came to the point of the trail that veered off to the shortcut and he had to make a decision. Todd swallowed hard as he looked at the little path that led into the forest. He then looked down at his watch and realized that if he took the normal way there, he'd be almost ten full minutes late. But if he took the shortcut, he'd get there just in time. Not wanting to make a bad impression, Todd took a deep breath and headed into the woods. For a while, things seemed perfectly normal. Todd chuckled to himself for having been so foolish as to let a silly story frighten him. The forest around him was actually rather pretty, and the path made for a gentle walk. He only had a few more minutes of walking and he'd pop out at the other side, very close to the bookshop. However, the longer Todd walked, the darker it grew. The forest was getting thicker so less light was reaching the trail. What's worse is that Todd could swear that he could hear the footsteps of someone else walking a distance behind him. Frightened, Todd stopped walking and held his breath and listened. But only the quiet sounds of the forest could be heard. So he began walking again, and it continued to get darker. It was getting much darker than it should have. Todd felt his heartbeat quicken as he noticed this. Even if the forest was thick, there was no way it should be getting this dark. It practically looked like it was nighttime. 
Deciding he wanted to get out of the forest as quickly as possible, Todd began walking faster. And again, he heard it. Step, 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 crunch. There was definitely someone following him. He turned around, but still saw no sign of anyone else in the forest. At this point, Todd was starting to feel very afraid, so he decided to walk a little quicker. But as he walked quicker, the sound of footsteps behind him also started to get faster. They also got louder. Todd looked over his shoulder once more and felt his blood run cold. For only a moment he saw it, a shadowy figure jumping out of sight behind a tree. Terrified and not knowing what else to do, Todd quickened his pace. But as he grew nearly to a sprint, the footsteps grew even faster behind him. By now it was so dark that Todd could barely see the path in front of him. He looked over his shoulder and could see the form of something in the shadows. It was following him. And even worse, he could now see something else. Big white eyes. Todd was so frightened, he broke into a sprint, running as fast as he could. The footsteps grew louder and louder, closer and closer. He could feel a hot, sticky breath on the back of his neck. Just when he thought he was done for, Todd suddenly stumbled out of the forest into the clearing on the other side of the forest. And just like that, things were normal again. The sun was shining and life went on as normal. Todd couldn't believe his eyes. He ran clear to the other side of the street before turning around. When he did, Todd saw a shadowy figure with big white eyes standing just at the edge of the forest. It watched him for a moment before slowly slinking back into the trees. Todd always made sure to leave for work with plenty of time from then on. The Porcelain Doll There once was a little girl who received a beautiful porcelain doll for her birthday. She was thrilled when she received it, as she had never seen such a lovely doll before. The doll's hair fell in soft blonde curls, and her lips were painted ruby red. But most striking were her sapphire blue eyes. The little girl listened happily as her mother explained that the doll was very old and had come from a faraway land. Smiling ear to ear, the little girl ran off to her room to play. During the daytime, the girl adored her doll, but as night fell, she began to feel differently. The same beautiful glass eyes she fancied in daylight began feeling eerie at night. It was odd, but no matter where she went, the doll's eyes seemed to follow her. When it was time to go to bed, the little girl placed the doll on top of her dresser. However, after getting in bed, she could feel the doll's eyes watching her from across the room. This scared her, and so she got out of bed and picked the doll up. Not wanting to be watched as she slept, the little girl put the doll inside of her closet and closed the door. Pleased with her work, the little girl went back to bed. But the little girl did not have restful sleep. That night, she dreamed that she heard the patter of tiny feet moving across her floor. When the little girl woke up the next morning, she was frightened to see the porcelain doll standing on top of her dresser again. Scared, the girl ran out to the kitchen to find her mother. Mother, did you move my doll last night? She asked. No, darling, her mother replied. I did not. This upset the little girl, but she tried her best to think of an explanation. Maybe during her restless slumber, she had sleepwalked and moved the doll herself. She nodded, happy to accept this reasoning. And so the little girl went on with her day. While playing in her room later that day, her mother entered wearing a frown on her face. Honey, did you touch one of my knives? You know the rules. The little girl crossed her arms and shook her head. Of course not, she cried. All right then, her mother said, her brows still squished into a scowl. The rest of the day passed well without incident, and the little girl put her worries about the doll behind her. At least, that is, 
until it was time for bed again. The little girl walked over to the dresser to put the little doll in the closet again, but to her shock, the doll was not there. The little girl looked all over her room. She searched under her bed, in her drawers, and even inside her closet, but she did not find the doll. Finally giving up, she decided to go to bed. Once again, while the little girl slept, she dreamt of the sound of tiny feet pattering across her floor. She tossed and turned a few times, hoping the noise would stop. That's when the little girl realized that she wasn't dreaming, and she certainly was not asleep. Now frightened, the little girl sat up. Slowly, she reached out a hand and turned on her lamp. As the light filled her bedroom, the little girl let out a scream. There, on her bedside table, stood the porcelain doll. Her arm was raised, and closed in her little fist was the missing knife. In the corn. All the kids in town hated walking past the old McCormick farm. They had a great big cornfield that edged up to the road with a small hill in the center. At the top of this hill, they kept a terrible old scarecrow. It had been there for as long as any of the kids had known. No one knew if it had a proper name, but the children of the town had taken to calling it Frank. Frank had a swollen, bulbous head with creepy little beady eyes sewn in. His smile was crooked and menacing, and his body was tattered and rotting away. During the day, Frank was creepy enough to look at, but at night, he was positively terrifying. What's worse is that the McCormick farm was right on the main road that the school bus stopped at, so every day, the children had to walk past it. Fortunately, school got out early enough that the kids still had a bit of time to pass the cornfield before the sun started going down. And when you were in the company of a few other people, it was far easier to feel brave. Some days, when the school children were feeling particularly brazen, they would dare each other to run up and touch Frank. Some kids were more timid and would gently pat the fabric dangling from Frank's torso. Meanwhile, others were showy and would strike and punch the scarecrow before dashing back to join the others. Most children, though, would refuse to participate altogether. One afternoon, Billy and his friends got off of the school bus and started their walk back to town. As usual, they came upon the old McCormick cornfield. Billy had always been nervous around the field. Ever since he was little, he had always hated passing by Frank. The old scarecrow scared him to the bone. Somehow, for all these years, Billy had gotten out of being dared to interact with the scarecrow. But unfortunately, his time was about to run out. As they neared the old cornfield, Billy looked away, not wanting to even see Frank. Unfortunately for Billy, his friends spotted this. Aw, is Billy afraid of the big, bad scarecrow? His friend Randy shouted. I am not, Billy huffed in response. Well then, you should go touch Frank, Randy replied. That's stupid. Tons of kids have done that before. He's just a rotten old scarecrow. That won't prove anything, Billy shot back. For a moment, he was very pleased with himself, thinking he had talked his way out of the dare once again. And at first, it seemed like it had worked. Randy sat quiet and thought for a moment before getting a wicked grin on his face. You're right, Billy. That wouldn't prove anything. That's why you need to come back and do it at night. All the children in the group gasped and looked at Billy with eager eyes. Billy grumbled under his breath. He should have just sucked it up and gone to touch the stupid thing when he had the chance. But he had to go and open his big mouth. That's stupid too, Randy, he replied. Sounds like you're scared, Randy said. Getting angry, Billy shouted back. Fine, I'll do it. But only if you do it too. All the children gasped and waited quietly for Randy's answer. Randy clearly wasn't expecting this turn of events, but he also didn't want to be seen as a chicken. You're on. Let's do it. Tonight at nine o'clock. 
The whole rest of the day, Billy dreaded the coming sunset. Why had he agreed? He was already scared of Frank as it was. Now he had to go touch him in the dark? What a nightmare! But time ticked on, and soon enough, Billy found himself back on the edge of town, looking out into the McCormick cornfield with Randy at his side. Two more of their friends had shown up to be witnesses. After waiting around nervously for a little while, Randy finally proclaimed that they should just go get it over with. Billy nodded in agreement, even though it was the last thing he actually wanted to do. And so, the two boys began walking through the corn. During the day, the tall stalks did not look anything out of the ordinary. But at night, the way they slightly swayed in the wind looked downright ominous. The two boys walked in silence until they reached the base of the hill. Looking up, they could see Frank looming over them from the top. Come on now, don't be a baby, Randy snickered before starting to climb the hill. Reluctantly, Billy followed. It wasn't a large hill, so it didn't take long for them to reach the top. Looking back, they could see their friends standing at the edge of the cornfield. They shouted words of encouragement and waved. This seemed to pump Randy up. He's not so scary, is he? Billy stared up at Frank and deeply disagreed. His bulbous head arched over to the side, and his beady little eyes glittered wickedly in the light of the moon. Somehow, his stitched smile looked more like a sneer as deep shadows were cast across his face. Randy wasted no time in running up and giving the tattered torso a firm slap. Their friends on the edge of the field cheered at the sight of this. Come on, Billy, don't chicken out now. Taking a big breath, Billy walked up to Frank. Slowly, he lifted his hand, and slower still, he reached out, never once taking his eyes off of Frank's rotten face. Ever so gently, he touched the hem of Frank's shirt before pulling back his hand. Billy's heart started pounding in his chest. It was probably just the wind or something, but he could swear that the moment his hand touched the fabric, Frank moved his head. He didn't even wait to receive the praise and cheers of his friends on the road before he began jogging down the hill. He could hear Randy cackling behind him, but he didn't care. He had done the dare and that was enough. But it wasn't enough for Randy. Wanting to score more cool points in front of his friends, Randy began smacking Frank. He struck him again and again as if he were a punching bag. He laughed all the while as he did this. Eventually, he got tired of this, though, and started to follow Billy down the hill. Soon, both of the boys were back in the tall corn. Why did you have to hit him like that? Billy asked. Oh, come on. It's just a stupid scarecrow. Who cares? Billy responded. Before Billy could reply, the sound of screams filled the air. It was their friends out by the road. They were screaming for their lives and ran away, leaving Billy and Randy behind. Randy shouted at the boys for leaving without him, but Billy stayed quiet. He had a bad feeling in his stomach. Slowly, he turned to look back to the top of the hill. Frank was gone. Terror filled Billy and he began running. Soon enough, Randy realized what happened as well and also began running. It was pitch dark and very confusing running through the corn, and Billy almost got lost several times. He looked over his shoulder and saw the stalks of corn shaking violently. Terrified, Billy ran even faster, and by some miracle, he made it to the edge of the cornfield and jumped out onto the road. While catching his breath, Billy suddenly heard a sound that chilled him to the bone. It was Randy screaming. He tried looking out into the corn for any sign of him, but couldn't see a thing. After a moment, the screaming stopped. It was eerily quiet. Even the wind stopped blowing. Then, suddenly, the corn started to shake again, heading towards the edge of the road. Billy was too scared to stick around, so he bolted down the road back towards town. He felt bad for leaving Randy behind, but there was no way he was going back there. When the following morning came and it was time for school, Billy met up with his other friends again. 
they both looked white as snow and scared stiff. When they got out to the cornfield, they looked out to the hill. What they saw tied a knot in their stomachs. Frank was back in his spot, but he was now wearing Randy's blood-soaked jacket. Deja vu. Melissa didn't often have nightmares, but last night was different. She found herself at the edge of town down a road she did not recognize. In front of her was a long dirt driveway covered in weeds. The driveway led up to a strange house. The paint on the house was cracked and peeling, and the window shutters hung crooked. It looked like no one had lived there in a very long time. The longer Melissa looked at the house, the more uncomfortable she got. A knot began to form in her stomach and she felt sick with fear and dread. Even though the house scared her, Melissa continued walking toward it. It was as though she could not control her body. Closer and closer she got to the rickety front porch. All the while, the bad feeling in her gut grew worse. Finally, right as Melissa was about to take a step up onto the porch, there was a loud, blaring noise. It was her alarm clock. Melissa had been startled awake and was ripped out of that terrible nightmare. She had never before been so happy to be awoken for school. Even though the dream was awful, Melissa did end up forgetting about it. She had a good day at school and was thrilled to have been invited to sit with the cool kids. It seemed like it was going to be the perfect day. They even invited Melissa to hang out after school. The group had decided that they would go riding bikes around town. Melissa didn't have a bike of her own, but a popular boy named Tommy allowed her to ride with him. They had so much fun whizzing around town. But everything began to change when Tommy decided it would be fun to take a detour to the edge of town. Little by little, that uncomfortable feeling in Melissa's stomach returned. The farther they rode, the more she began to recognize her surroundings. But this made no sense. Melissa knew she had never been here before. She told this to the others, and they said she was just experiencing something called déjà vu. It was an interesting feeling where you strongly believe you've seen, heard, or done something before, even though you never have. This didn't get rid of the icky feeling, but Melissa accepted the answer. It was when they came upon a weed-filled dirt driveway at the very edge of town that Melissa could no longer ignore the bad feeling. She was having deja vu again. She knew this old driveway, as well as the run-down old house that stood at the end. Melissa gasped and pointed at the house. She said she had a very bad feeling and didn't want to go near it. But the other kids were very excited. Since the house clearly seemed to be abandoned, they wanted to find a way inside and make it their secret base. Against Melissa's wishes, the group got closer and closer to the old house. That feeling of deja vu struck again. Everything was exactly the same as the dream, right down to the peeling paint and crooked shutters. Melissa was very scared now and told the others she didn't want to get any closer. The other kids scowled at Melissa and asked her if she wasn't cool enough to hang out with them after all. Melissa felt herself blush in shame and lowered her head. She shook her head and apologized and continued walking toward the house with the other children. It was right as Melissa got to the porch that she couldn't take it anymore. It was the same spot that her dream ended and she refused to get any closer. The other kids laughed at her, but continued walking up toward the crooked old door. Melissa didn't care if the others made fun of her. Her heart was almost beating out of her chest. The feeling of dread in her stomach was unbearable. Just as she lifted her head and looked up to the porch, there was something she hadn't noticed before. Leading from the stairs to the doorway was a dark, rusty stain. It looked like blood. It appeared something gory had been dragged from the porch and into the house. Melissa then looked up to the door itself. Near the top was a little glass window to peep out at guests. 
behind the glass, Melissa saw a pair of eyes staring out at them. These eyes were an eerie, unnatural yellow color and looked evil. Melissa screamed and pointed to the eyes. Hearing this, the other children looked up and saw the eyes too. They then looked down and saw the trail of blood. Just then, the doorknob began to rattle and turn. The children screamed and ran for their bikes. Lucky for them, the door was so old and crooked, it seemed to not work very well. Because of this, whoever was inside appeared to be having trouble getting it to open. The children were all on their bikes and quickly pedaling away when they heard the loud crash of the door finally opening and the deep, gravelly shouts of a man yelling after them. Melissa had been too scared to look behind her, and Tommy refused to tell her what he saw. His face went pale, and he simply said he didn't want to talk about it. Melissa figured it was better this way. Tommy dropped her off at home and didn't speak another word. The following morning, while Melissa ate breakfast, her father turned on the TV to a news station. Normally, Melissa didn't pay attention to this, but the words caught her attention. The police were on the lookout for a suspected murderer. They thought he was hiding somewhere in their city. The TV flashed an image of a drawing of the killer and Melissa's stomach cramped. Staring back at her were the same eerie yellow eyes. Melissa never did get that deja vu again, and she also never ignored that feeling in her gut when it told her something wasn't right. Tangled in seaweed. Deep in the mountains, in a dense forest, a group of people were camping. They gathered around a roaring campfire and sang songs and roasted marshmallows. After a while, a man began telling scary stories. Most of the group loved this, except for a woman named Julia. Julia didn't like scary stories and asked the man to stop, but instead of stopping, the man got a wicked grin and asked the group if they had heard about the serial killer that was recently caught in the area. Everyone in the group was very curious, even Julia, who was scared stiff. The man began telling the tale of the evil man who had gone on a killing spree in these very woods. The police eventually captured him, but to that day they never did find the bodies. They searched the woods high and low, but had no luck, and the killer refused to tell them. This scared Julia even more than the ghost stories. She shouted at the man to stop talking about it and ran off to go sleep in her tent. Eventually, the whole group headed to bed, but Julia had trouble falling asleep. She couldn't stop thinking about the serial killer and the missing bodies. But eventually, she did fall asleep, and morning came. The following day, the group was going down to the lake to swim. The water was cool and murky brown. You could only see a foot or two under the surface until it turned into total darkness. However, the group did not care. They jumped in and splashed and had a lot of fun. Before they knew it, the group had swum far out into the middle of the lake. The water was extremely deep and dark. The worst part about it was that since the water was so murky, every time a slimy piece of seaweed touched them, they couldn't even see it. This scared Julia quite a bit. She hated the feeling of the weeds tangling on her legs. After kicking off a few slimy pieces of seaweed, Julia felt her foot become tangled in another. This time, she struggled to shake it off. The seaweed had firmly tangled all around her ankle. Something about this seaweed made Julia feel uneasy. It wasn't slimy like the other seaweed, but instead long and stringy. She wished the water wasn't so murky so she could more easily see it to get it off. Julia cried out to the others in the group. When she told them of the strange debris stuck to her leg, they replied that it was only seaweed. It grew wild in the lake and all of them could feel it on their feet too. Julia shouted that it was stuck to her foot, and the others simply told her to yank until it came free. And so, Julia thrashed her leg about until she felt the seaweed snap away from the stalk. Relieved, 
she reached down to pull the foul weeds off of her leg. But when her hand made contact with it, goosebumps went down her spine. What she felt in her hand was not a plant. Slowly, Julia brought the strands to the surface. What Julia was clutching in her hand was not seaweed at all. It was a clump of long, blonde hair. Julia then got a terrible feeling in her gut. The others looked at her in shock. They too had a bad feeling. Despite how scared she was, Julia had to know. She took a deep breath and dove under the water. It was hard to see at first because of how murky the water was, but the farther down Julia swam, she could begin to see something. And it was something terrible. Staring right back at Julia were two glossy, glazed-over eyes. Julia was staring at a pale white body. It was floating lifelessly in the murky water with a rope tied to its ankle. And over near Julia's friends, she could see even more bodies, and their long hair floated up and wrapped around the swimmer's feet. A feeling of dread overcame Julia. She sprang back to the surface and screamed. She now knew where the serial killer had been hiding the missing bodies. The Shadow Man A few years back, a man bought an old house at the edge of town. Many people thought he was crazy, for the house was said to be haunted by the Shadow Man. There was an old legend about the frightening specter that lurked in that old house. It was said that every night at midnight, the Shadow Man would start walking up the basement stairs. Creak. Creak. You could hear his footsteps on the old wooden steps. The Shadow Man would then rattle the doorknob at the top of the stairs and then let himself into the house. People didn't know exactly what would happen if the Shadow Man caught you, but no one dared stick around long enough to find out. No one until the man who bought the haunted house. The man was either very brave or very foolish, but he didn't seem bothered by the stories. The man didn't believe in ghosts, after all. When the townsfolk told the man the story of the Shadow Man, he simply laughed and told them it was a bunch of nonsense, and so he moved into the house. The day passed and nothing was out of place. The man smiled to himself as he thought about how silly those stories were. But when the sun started to set and the chill of night fell, the man wasn't feeling quite as good. After a while, the man suddenly felt as if he weren't alone. It felt as if someone, or something, was watching him. This sent shivers down his spine. But the man did not believe in ghosts. He laughed at himself for being silly. He settled back down in his chair and tried to relax. But this was not easy, as only a moment later, he heard something. Creak. Creak. The man's heart started beating quickly. He clearly heard the sound of squeaking boards. Something was walking up the basement stairs. Frightened, the man shouted. And at the sound of his voice, the creaking stopped. The man was very scared now, but he still didn't want to believe the stories. So he got up and walked to the basement door. Slowly, the man reached out and opened the door. The stairway was quite creepy. The old, gnarled steps faded into total darkness at the bottom. But there, deep in the darkness, was clearly the shape of a man. He was darker than even the shadows around him, and he wore a wide brim hat. The only bit of light came from the tiny pinpricks that seemed to be his eyes. Just as quickly as the man saw the shadowy figure, it disappeared. The man was very frightened now, but he was even more stubborn. He shook his head and snapped the door shut. He decided that he must be seeing things because he was tired. And so 
the man turned and walked away from the door. He would go upstairs to bed right away. But as the man walked through the house, he felt eyes on him again. Someone was watching him. Quickly, the man looked over his shoulder. Just then, the doorknob on the basement door began to jiggle. With a terrible squeak, it opened all on its own. And out from the darkness reached a long and bony shadow hand. Terrified, the man ran to the nearest light switch and turned it on. And just like that, the hand was gone. The man's heart was pounding now. He shook his head again. He did not believe in ghosts. He was very, very tired. He'd get some sleep and everything would be better. He decided this and continued through the house. He left the light on behind, just in case, though. The man had nearly calmed himself down by the time he got to the hallway. Then, the light from the other room suddenly went out. He stood in near total darkness, and worse yet, the light switch was all the way on the other side of the hall. The man was now terrified. He ran as quickly as he could down the hallway and reached for the light switch. Before switching it, the man looked over his shoulder. To his horror, the shadow man was there, standing halfway down the hallway. It stood perfectly still, its pinprick eyes locked onto the man. Quickly, the man turned on the lights, and once again, the shadow man disappeared. The man was so scared that he ran as fast as he could back to his room, hitting the lights in every room he passed through. When he finally got to his bedroom, the man turned on the lamp next to his bed and locked the door shut behind him. His heart was pounding in his chest, but still the man was stubborn. He shook his head and told himself he was being silly. There had to be an explanation for what was happening. Something that didn't have anything to do with ghosts. He had almost started to believe his own words, until the light flowing under his door from the hallway suddenly went out. The man yelped in fear and crawled into his bed. He did not believe in ghosts. Creak. The man pulled his blankets up to his chin. He did not believe in ghosts. Creak. The doorknob began to rattle, but he did not believe in ghosts. Suddenly, the lamp next to the man's bed went out, and the room was filled with darkness. And right at the foot of the bed stood the shadow man, his pinprick eyes looking down on him. Suddenly, the man supposed maybe he really did believe in ghosts after all. Well, that's it for section one. Next up will be section two, ghost stories. I do hope you enjoyed today's story time. As previously mentioned, all these stories can be found within my latest book, Don't Open the Door, Scary Stories and American Folk Tales. I do hope you'll consider checking it out. It's currently available on Amazon in both ebook and paperback, as well as for Arizona residents who want to run over to Terror Trader, where signed copies are being sold in person. And if you enjoy these stories, please consider running over to Amazon and leaving the book a review. So far, I've sold plenty of copies, but I've only gotten a handful of reviews, so it's greatly appreciated. Anyways, I'll be back real soon with section two. I hope you enjoyed that, and please feel free to leave your comments down below. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay creepy.